And what of Hazdrubal? Had he not a wife at Carthage who had rather take her life? For as she watched the Romans win the town, she took her children with her and leapt down into the fire. There she chose to burn rather than let them do, do their evil turn. Did not Lucre choose death for her escape in Rome of old when she had suffered rape for Tarquin's lust? Did not she think it shame to live a life that had been robbed of name? The seven virgins of Miletus, too, took their own lives. Were they not bound to do, lest they be ravished by their, go by their Gaulish foes? More than a thousand stories, I suppose, touching on this theme were easy now to tell. Did not his wife, when Abadrates fell, take her own life and let the purple flood glide from her veins to mingle with his blood, saying, My body shall at least not be defiled by man, so far as lies in me, since there are found so many, if one delves, that gladly have preferred to kill themselves rather than be defiled, need more be sought for my example? Better were the thought to kill myself at once than suffer thus. I will be faithful to Arvigarus, or slay myself, as these examples bid, as the dear daughter of Demotion did, who chose to die rather than be defiled. Oh, Skidassus! Thou also hadst a child that slew herself, and sad it is to read how she preferred her death to such a deed, as pitiable, or even more, I say, the Thebian maid who gave her life away to foil Nicanor and a like disgrace, another virgin at that very place, raped by a Macedonian, it is said, died to repay her loss of maidenhead. What shall I say? Of, Nicar of Nicaratus' wife, who being thus dishonored took her life, and oh, how true to Alcibiades his lover was, she died no less than these, for seeking to give burial to her dead. What? See what a wife. Alestus was, she said. And what says Homer of Penelope? All Greece can celebrate her chastity. Laodamia, robbed of all her joy. Protestilius, being killed at Troy, would live no longer, seeing that he was slain. Of noble Portia, let me think again. She could not live on being forced to part from Brutus, whom she loved with all her heart. And Artemisa, faithful to her man, is honored, even by the barbarian. O oh, Tuta queen, thy wifely chastity should be a mirror for all wives to see. I say the same of Bilia, and as soon of chaste Valeria and Rogadun. Thus for a day or two she spent her breath, poor Dorigan, in every purported death, in every proposed death. On the third day, however, of her plight, home came Arvigarus, that excellent knight, and questioned her. What was she crying for? But she continued weeping all the more. Alas, she said, that ever I was born. Thus have I said, she answered. Thus have sworn, she told him all that you have heard before. It need not be repeated here once more. Her husband smiled at her with friendly eyes and countenance and answered in, the, in this wise. And is there nothing, Dorigan, but this? No, no, so help me God with emphasis, she answered. Is it not enough, too much? Well, wife, he said, it's better not to touch a sleeping dog, so I have often heard. All may be well, but you must keep your word, for as may God be merciful to me, I, I rather would be stabbed than live to see you fail in truth. The very love I bear you bids you keep truth in that it cannot spare you. Truth is the highest thing in a man's keeping. And on that word and on the word he suddenly burst out weeping and said, But I forbid, on pain of death, as long as you shall live or draw your breath, 
that you should ever speak of this affair to living soul, and what I have to bear, I'll bear as best I may. Now wash your face, be cheerful, none must guess at this disgrace. He called a maid servant and squire then, and said, Go out with Lady Dorigan, attend upon her, whither she, whither she will say. They took their leave of him, and went their way. Not knowing why their mistress was to go, it was his settled purpose none should know. Perhaps a heap of you will want to say, Lewd, foolish man, to act in such a way, putting his wife into such jeopardy. Listen before you judge them, wait and see. She may have better fortune, gentlemen, than you imagine. Keep your judgments, then, till you have heard my story, which now turns to Amorous Aurelius, as he burns for Dorigan. They happen soon to meet right in town, in the most crowded street, which she was bound to use, however loath, to reach the garden, and to keep her oath. Aurelius, garden words, was going too, a faithful spy on all she used to do. He kept close watch whenever she went out, and so, by accident or luck, no doubt, they met each other. He, his features glowing, saluted her, and asked where she was going, and she replied, as one half-driven mad, Why to the garden, as my husband bade? To keep my plighted word, alas, alas! Aurelius, stunned at what had come to pass, felt the great surge of pity that arose at sight of Dorigan in all her woes, and for Arbogast, the noble knight, that bade her keep her word of honor white, so loath he was that she should break her truth, and such a rush of pity filled the youth that he was moved to think the better course was to forgo his passion than to force an act on her of such a churlish kind, and against such nobility of mind, so in few words the lad addressed her thus, Madam, say to your Arvaragus, that since I well perceive his nobleness toward yourself, and also your distress, knowing the shame that he would rather take, and that were pity, that you should break your plighted word, I'd suffer too, than seek to come between his love and you. So, madam, I release into your hand all bonds or deeds of covenant, and that stand between us, and suppose all treaties torn, you may have made with me since you were born. I give my word never to chide or grieve you for any promise given, and so I leave you, madam, the very best and truest wife, and ever yet, I knew, that ever yet I knew in all my life. Let women keep their promises to men, or at least remember Dorigan. A squire can do a generous thing with grace, and well can a knight in any case. And she went down and thanked him on her knees. Home to her husband then, with heart at ease, she went and told him all as I've recorded. You may be sure he felt so well rewarded. No words of mine could possibly express his feelings. Why then linger? You may guess. Arvaragus and Dorigan his wife, in sovereign happiness, pursued their life. No discord in their love was ever seen. He cherished her as though she were a queen, and she stayed true as she had been before. Of these two lovers you will get no more. Aurelius all whose labor had been lost, cursing his birth, reflected on the cost. Alas, he said, alas, that I am bound to pay in solid gold a thousand pounds to that philosopher. What shall I do? All I can see is that I'm ruined too. That's my, there's my inheritance that I have to sell and to be a beggar. Then there's this as well. I can't stay here, a shame and a disgrace to all my family. I must leave this place. And yet, he might prove lenient. I could pay a yearly sum upon a certain day, and thank him gratefully. I can but try, but I will keep my truth. I will not lie. And sad at heart, he went to search his coffer, and gathered up what gold he had to offer, his master, some five hundred pound, I guess, and begged him, as a gentleman no less, to grant him time enough to pay the rest. Sir, I can boast in making this request, he said. I've never failed my word as yet, and I will certainly repay this debt. 
I owe you, master, ill as I may fare. Yes, though I turn to begging and go bare, if you'd vouchsafe me on security, a little respite, say two years or three, all would be fine. If not, I'll have to sell my patrimony. There's no more to tell. Then this philosopher in sober pride, having considered what he'd said, replied, Did I not keep my covenant with you? You did indeed, he said, and truly too. And did you not enjoy your lady then? No, no, he sighed and thought of Dorigan. What was the reason? Tell me if you can. Reluctantly, Aurelius then began to tell the story as you have heard before. There is no need to tell it you once more. He said, her husband in his nobleness would have preferred to die in his distress rather than, his, than that his wife should break her word. He told him of her grief and what occurred, how loath she was to be a wicked wife and how she would have rather lost her life. Her vow was made in innocent confusion. She'd never heard of magical illusion. So great a sense of pity rose in me, I sent her back as freely then as he had sent her to me. Let her go away. That's the whole story. There's no more to say. Then the magician answered, My dear brother, each of you did as nobly as the other. You are a squire, sir, and he a knight. But God forbid in all his blissful might that men of learning should not come as near to nobleness as any. Never fear. Sir, I release you of your thousand pound, no less than if you'd crept out of the ground just now and never had to do with me. I will not take a penny, sir, in fee. For all my knowledge and my work to rid the coast of rocks, I'm paid for what I did, well paid, and that's enough. Farewell, good day, he mounted on his horse and rode away. My lords, I'll put a question. Tell me true. Which seemed the finest gentleman to you? Ere we ride onwards, tell me any one. I have no more to say. My tale is done.